In this malware analysis challenge, we examine the specimen Trickster.exe. You can download Trickster from Dropbox using the link in the description, and you can also find it here on malwarechallenges.com. We'll go ahead and download the specimen and prepare it to introduce it into our lab environment. We'll just drag and drop it, and now we'll extract it. And we'll use the password malware123. At this point, we'll take a snapshot of the lab system in its pre-infected state. We are now ready to begin the malware analysis challenge. Now the goal of this challenge is to identify the purpose of trickster.exe, figure out specifically what it does and how it affects the infected system, and to develop at least three indicators of compromise so that they can be used to identify this specimen in the future. Now as we begin, let's run strings2 against trickster.exe to see if we can get any clues about the nature of this malware. Unfortunately, it seems that there are few, if any, usable strings to be found. This strongly suggests that the malware is packed or encrypted, which will impede our ability to perform code or static-based analysis. Now we'll begin our analysis using the sysinternals tool, Autoruns. We'll go ahead and save a clean copy of the Autoruns on the system before we run the malware. Now we'll go ahead and execute the malware running as administrator so that we can see its full potential. We'll go ahead and refresh auto runs. And then we'll compare it to our clean baseline. And we've immediately identified an anomaly. It appears that there is a scheduled task called services update. And if we look at the full image path, we see that it is in the app data roaming when app directory. And there appears to be a non-human readable executable. Now we can get the details of this auto run by looking in the Windows task scheduler. We seem to have found the services update auto run, and it runs immediately upon user login and once every three minutes. And an instance of this task is already running. While we know that trickster.exe attains persistence using a Windows scheduled task, we do not yet know what this program, which I'll call u.exe, does. So, Given the fact that it runs once every three minutes, it stands to reason that this is a command and control beacon. So to prove this theory, we'll use TCP log view to log network connections. Within about three minutes, you should start to see periodic beacons to public facing IP addresses. You'll notice that all these connections appear to be coming from the process ID 1568. We'll go ahead and take a look at that in Process Explorer just to confirm that this is in fact the scheduled task u.exe. And there it is. So it seems that this is our command and control beacon. Now you'll notice that u.exe is located in the app data roaming win app directory. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. So it seems that u.exe has also inserted a file called client ID, group tag, and a directory called modules. If we open these files in a text editor, we'll see what appears to be a unique identifier. This is the host name of my malware analyst platform. This is likely some identifier used by the command and control beacon 
to track the infected system. We'll examine group tag and see another similar identifier. And then there's this directory modules, which is currently empty. So it's likely that when this command and control beacon connects to a control server, it has the capability to download additional modules to increase the functionality of the command and control backdoor. At this point in the analysis, we have a pretty good idea as to the purpose and function of both trickster.exe and u.exe. But we have yet to take a look at it at the code level. We'll start by dragging u.exe into Ida Pro. And we'll accept the default options. Let's start by taking a look at the imports, the libraries that this program imports when it runs. By examining the libraries, we can infer that u.exe interacts with the Windows registry, that it can accept command line arguments, and then it creates a file, which is consistent with the client ID and group tag files that it uh, deposited on the file system. But if we skim through the rest of these imports, we notice that there are no libraries for network connectivity. And this is strange because we observed during our behavioral analysis that u.exe does in fact beacon to command and control servers. Yet that functionality is not seen in the imports present uh, in the Ida Pro view. Perhaps we can change our vantage point by examining u.exe in a debugger. We'll drag u.exe to Ollie debug. And it gives us a message saying that this file appears to be compressed, encrypted, and contains a large amount of embedded data. In most cases, you never want to analyze this code because it will create more problems than it solves. This is also another strong indicator that this program is indeed encrypted and or packed. If we go ahead and just play the program in Ollie Debug, we'll see that it runs, but then quickly terminates. It seems likely that this program has defense mechanisms in place to terminate if it detects that it is being single-stepped through a debugger. Now we face a dilemma because we want to examine this specimen at the code level, yet its defenses and the fact that it's encrypted or packed is preventing us from examining it. So rather than go to great lengths to try and figure out how it is packed or encrypted, we're actually just going to dump this process after it has been cleanly unpacked in memory. And to do that, we're going to use a tool called Process Dump, not to be confused with Proc Dump by SysInternals. Now, before we use Process Dump, we're going to revert our malware analysis platform to a non infected state. Next, we're going to use Process Dump to create a clean baseline of the objects presently in memory. We'll use the command process dump 32exe tech db gen and this will generate our memory baseline. You'll have to give process dump several minutes before the baseline is complete. If all goes as planned you'll receive a finished message and you're now ready to move on to the next step. Now to capture trickster.exe, we're going to need to do a little pre-positioning. We'll start by just getting the command line syntax for process dump ready. We're going to dump the process trickster.exe. And we'll go ahead and run process explorer so that we can watch the malware run. And we'll dock that over here. And now we'll go ahead and run trickster.exe and then quickly run process dump. Now process dump is dumping trickster. And we now have a version of trickster.exe ready for analysis in Ida Pro or Ollie Debug.
We'll follow the exact same process for dumping u.exe. And we now have an unpacked version of u.exe available for analysis. We can now take Trickster and bring it over to Ida Pro, and we should see more functionality than we observed when the specimen was packed. So now we see some additional libraries that we did not see before. We see Sleep, Get Tick Count, which probably suggests that this is the defense mechanism the malware specimen uses inside a debugger. Basically, if you're unfamiliar, get tick count checks how many clock cycles have elapsed since the malware specimen has run. If get tick count is below a certain threshold, then the malware knows that it is running inside of a debugger and it will terminate. We can go ahead and follow sleep and see exactly what it's doing. I'll use the xref feature to see the context in which sleep is called. You'll notice that the sleep command receives a parameter of 1388 in hex, which translates to about five seconds. In other words, this malware specimen is sleeping for five seconds. But why is it sleeping? If you scroll up, you'll see calls to numerous functions, including create directory, path combine, and copy file. And then the function ends with a call to create process. So it stands to reason that trickster.exe deposits u.exe on the file system, sleeps for five seconds, and then calls create process. And in this case, create process is probably calling the Windows task scheduler to schedule a scheduled task that runs u.exe. Now we can spend a lot more time going through trickster.exe and Ida Pro as well as a debugger. But for completeness, we're going to go ahead and just take a look at u.exe. And you'll notice that process dump deposited two separate specimens onto the file system. We can take a look at both of them, but I'm just going to take a look at the second one because there's some interesting findings there. We'll accept the default options. We'll go ahead and take a look at the program's imports to see what functionality it is trying to use from the Windows API. Now you can explore these various libraries and you'll make some interesting findings. You'll see a lot of calls to libraries that facilitate encryption and decryption. And you'll also see calls to the WinHttp library. And the functions within this library facilitate this specimen's ability to communicate to command and control servers, download files, and access resources on the internet. So it would seem that this functionality is consistent with what we observed during our dynamic analysis. And likewise, you could spend a tremendous amount of time just going through this code. However, at this point, I think we know enough about this malware specimen. I think we've derived enough indicators of compromise to close this investigation. Now that we've spent sufficient time examining this malware using our own tools and techniques, we'll do a couple searches on Google to see if this malware has been seen before. I'm going to search for the files that were created on the file system because I think, that, I think there's a pretty good chance that uh, this will be associated with our malware and other reports on the internet. We'll take a look at the first result and we'll see a report from Fraudwatch International about a specimen called TrickBot. If we take a look at their report, we'll see that this specimen mirrors the behavior we observed of trickster.exe. Therefore, it stands to reason that trickster.exe is actually a specimen from the TrickBot family of malware. If you continue reading the report, you'll learn that TrickBot is actually a banking trojan designed to steal credit card information, passwords, etc. So this wraps up our analysis of trickster.exe. If you take a look at my walkthrough on malwarechallenges.com, you can get a summarized list of the exercise solutions. We identified the purpose of the malware. In this case, trickster.exe functioned as a malware dropper that deposited u.exe onto the file system.
and we learned that u.exe is a banking trojan belonging to the TrickBot family of malware. We identified the absolute path of the second stage payload as occurring in C, users, username, app data, roaming, win app. We covered the specific activities that the malware performed on the file system. We observed that it attained persistence using a scheduled task and that it beaconed to at least 18 command and control IP addresses. And then throughout all this analysis, we came up with at least three signatures. We know that it attains persistence with a scheduled task. We know the directories that it deposits files, and we know the IP addresses that it is beaconing to. I hope you enjoyed this exercise from malwarechallenges.com. If you made additional findings that were not covered in this video, please be sure to leave a comment below. Now I'll also point out that this is my first YouTube video ever, so I would love to hear your feedback. If you have tips or suggestions about how to improve the quality of these exercises or the video itself, uh, definitely leave a comment in the description. So that wraps up this malware challenge. My name is Michael Long. I go by the handle Blue Sentinel. And be sure to check out malwarechallenges.com for more malware challenges.